around four billion years ago at the turn of two geological eons. The Hadean eon, when our planet had just formed and settled, was now over, and a new Archean eon had just begun. The atmosphere was still unbreathable for any known animal or plant, and the oceans were depleted of oxygen. As inhospitable as it seemed, our planet was already much more than just another barren rocky world in space. Quite the opposite, it was literally teeming with life, invisible to the naked eye. Primitive microorganisms inhabited its water and soil. These first denizens of life were called prokaryotes, single-celled microbes that lacked a nucleus and had no organelles. They were primitive, but by no means simple. Prokaryotes possessed all of the features that are required to fall under the definition of life. They were autonomous, completely self-sustained, and not dependent on other organisms. They were also metabolizing, or simply consuming chemicals and transforming them into energy for their bodies. Finally, prokaryotes were complex in their organization, able to evolve, develop, and most importantly, reproduce. Prokaryotes became living organisms when they obtained the mechanism that allowed them to replicate and pass on their genes. At first, such a mechanism was a single-stranded RNA molecule that was able to produce its own copies and become a self-sustained chemical system. RNA was able to store the information or blueprint of how to build a copy of an organism, as well as replicate itself according to this blueprint. The weak spot of RNA was that it was relatively unstable and easily damaged by the catalysts, or enzymes, necessary for metabolism. The solution was the emergence of a much more stable, double-stranded DNA molecule that was essentially a double RNA with a different sugar. DNA became the reliable storehouse of genetic information, while RNA became the workhorse that participated in the transcription and translation of the information into the actual production of proteins, as well as the replication process. These first microorganisms appeared and thrived in a world that would have been deadly for us or any other multicellular animal. They survived on the chemical nutrients in anoxic environments and were likely resistant to the deadly ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun with no ozone layer in the atmosphere to block it. It is assumed that from 4.3 to 3.8 billion years ago, our planet had been regularly struck with comets and asteroids, resulting in global catastrophes. This hypothetical long-lasting disaster called the Late Heavy Bombardment Event was caused by orbital swings of giant gaseous planets. Some of the asteroids are believed to have been three or even 500 kilometers in diameter. When such large objects hit Earth, all of the water within thousands of kilometers from the impact would have been evaporated. The atmosphere would have become incredibly hot and huge amounts of molten rock debris called ejecta would have launched into space. This would have been followed by giant tsunamis spreading away from ground zero. Shortly after the impact, Ejecta would have fallen back to Earth as an intense, fiery rock shower. If the late heavy bombardment really happened, it would have been difficult for living organisms to survive. So how did life make it through such massive and frequent asteroid strikes? Firstly, the late heavy bombardment might not have been as heavy as one might think. Large asteroids probably hit our planet more often than usual, but the intervals between the catastrophes were tens of thousands or even a few million years. Life would have had time to recover. Secondly, even when a massive asteroid 500 kilometers across plummeted into Earth, only half of the planet would have been directly affected. The ocean would have boiled and evaporated on one hemisphere, but the other hemisphere would have remained a safe place for microbes. In addition, those microbes most likely populated the soil a kilometer or more beneath the surface, where they would have hardly noticed any disturbance above them. Even today, microbial underground communities comprise 70% of all bacteria and archaea that live on Earth, and their mass exceeds the mass of the entire human population by 400 times. Thirdly, 
Recent research has shown that the late heavy bombardment might not have occurred at all. It's possible that there was only one heavy bombardment that happened during the formation of the solar system, and it ended quite early, before 4.48 billion years ago. This would have allowed life to begin even earlier than previously thought, perhaps more than 4 billion years ago. When we look at the Moon's surface, we see a great number of giant impact craters made by asteroids in the past. Some of these craters, for example the one called the Imbrium Basin, are over a thousand kilometers in diameter, meaning that the asteroids that made them were at least 250 kilometers wide. If the Moon was intensively bombarded by large objects in the past, so must have been Earth. But when, and for how long? Was it a gradual process that started at the dawn of the solar system's formation and lasted until present? Or was it a catastrophic event when multiple asteroids hit the planets of the inner solar system at the same time? It seemed as though the analysis of the rocks from the Moon brought to Earth during the Apollo missions revealed the answer. When samples of the lunar impact melts were studied and dated, they showed that a huge impact happened between 3.8 and 4.1 billion years ago. This meant that at the same time, a large number of asteroids must have hit Earth as well. Given that it is generally assumed that by that time life on Earth had already emerged, it became hard to imagine how it managed to survive such a catastrophe. Scientists gave this event a name, the Late Heavy Bombardment, or LHB for short, because it happened relatively late in the formation process of our solar system. But why did it happen? From the beginning, the most obvious suspects to blame were the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. There were different hypotheses as to how exactly these planets wreaked such havoc. But here is an interesting one called the Grand Tack Hypothesis. Its name comes from nautical terminology, where the word tacking means the constant changing of directions of a sailboat while traveling against the wind. In this case, tacking is applied to the planets, and to Jupiter in particular. The hypothesis goes like this. When the planets of the solar system were almost completely formed, the initial collisions between the planetesimals and asteroids came to an end. The leftover debris was pushed out to the remote outer orbits, and things calmed down. But not for long. Soon, Jupiter, which initially formed at 3.5 astronomical units from the Sun, got caught up in currents of flowing gas that were still abundant at that time in the young solar system. It then started to migrate inward, towards the Sun. As Jupiter migrated, Saturn followed right behind. By the time Jupiter reached the 1.5 astronomical units point, it captured Saturn in an orbital resonance. While Jupiter made three circles around the Sun, Saturn made two, affecting Jupiter with its gravity. In the meantime, the gas in between the two planets had expelled. As a result, both gas giants stopped their migration towards the Sun and reversed their direction of travel, starting to move away from the center of the solar system until Jupiter ended up at its current orbit of 5.2 astronomical units and Saturn at 7. It is thought that in the beginning, Uranus was the most distant planet of the solar system, while Neptune formed between Saturn and Uranus. The gravitational disturbance caused by the dance of Jupiter and Saturn switched the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, having thrown the latter right into the peripheral ring of rocky and icy leftovers that remained after the solar system's formation. Neptune started orbiting among these rocks, throwing them in different directions, like a snowplow. This is how the multitudes of comets and asteroids from the edges of the solar system ended up heading towards the inner planets, including Earth, and eventually colliding with them. The Grand Tack hypothesis had its strengths and weaknesses in its attempt to explain the formation of the solar system as we observe it today. Until recently, it also helped to explain the late heavy bombardment event that was said to have occurred as a result of the gas giant's orbital swings. But there came another, even more plausible model of the solar system's formation that was called the Early Instability Hypothesis. It implies that at the time the planets were just forming from the protoplanetary disk, the orbits of the planetesimals were highly unstable. The gas giants formed first, followed by the rocky inner planets, 
In fact, computer simulations suggest that initially there was an additional icy giant planet orbiting the Sun. While forming, the planets kept changing their orbital eccentricity, meaning that their orbits constantly went back and forth from being circular to elliptical, affecting the distribution of gas and building materials in the developing solar system. The hypothetical icy giant was thrown away into outer space, and the planets finished forming. Eventually, their orbit stabilized for good. The early instability hypothesis explains and describes the evolutionary process of the solar system in its early stages quite elegantly, and when digitally simulated, predicts the formation of a planetary system exactly like ours, with the right number of planets placed in the right locations and being the right sizes. It even allows for speculation that the hypothetical icy giant that got expelled from the solar system could indeed be that mysterious planet X astronomers are hunting for. But there is a problem. The early instability model doesn't leave any room for the late heavy bombardment event. If the solar system stabilized very early on, about 4.5 billion years ago, what caused a huge number of space rocks to hit Earth and other inner planets around 4 billion years ago? Do we even know for certain that the late heavy bombardment actually happened? We cannot find evidence of such ancient impacts on our planet. Erosion and plate tectonics would have destroyed the craters long ago. This is why scientists have looked for clues on the planets, satellites and asteroids that are not subjected to wind, water and constant surface recycling. Such an ideal spot was the Moon. Interestingly enough, Along with the emergence of the early instability model that doesn't predict any cause for the late heavy bombardment event, the evidence that gave us reason to believe that this event did happen became less and less convincing. In recent years, some researchers have started doubting the results of the melted lunar rock dating. They suggest that dating could have given erroneous results due to the very small number of samples, or could have been affected and reset by the later asteroid impacts. It also could be that initially, scientists dated the samples that point to a single catastrophic impact that indeed did happen on the Moon 4 billion years ago, near Mare Imbrium. Moreover, in 2019, a study of the most ancient Martian meteorites suggested that all major collisions of Mars with asteroids had come to an end by 4.48 billion years ago. So where does all of this leave us? The gas giant's orbital migration and orbital instability might have taken place, but much earlier than was originally thought. Additionally, it looks as though there was only ever one heavy bombardment of Earth during the formation of the solar system, which probably ended 4.48 billion years ago. As for the late heavy bombardment event, the evidence that has been accumulated in recent years suggests that it most likely never occurred. And early life on Earth did not have to struggle with a superheated atmosphere and evaporated water. Further research will probably clarify whether the late heavy bombardment was real or just a phantom theory. Regardless of whether or not the late heavy bombardment actually happened, large asteroids and comets did collide with Earth from time to time leaving giant impact craters that would eventually erode away. 3.6 billion years ago, Earth was still covered with ocean and volcanic islands, but it is thought that a very small first continent called Valbara existed at that time. Today, its traces can be found in South Africa and Western Australia. Meanwhile, the microscopic inhabitants of our planet went on changing the world around them. Very early in their history, ancient prokaryotes split into major domains, bacteria and archaea. Despite their similarities in shape and appearance, members of these two groups differ from each other by their molecular and genetic characteristics. Later in the history of life, archaea would play a crucial role in the emergence of eukarya, the third major domain of organisms that include multicellular forms and contain nuclei in their cells. But bacteria were already changing our planet, creating an environment in which the existence of complex life would eventually become possible. The focus of our story, for now, is on cyanobacteria. While other organisms that populated Earth in the early Archean were using chemosynthesis 
consuming chemical elements from their environments to obtain energy, cyanobacteria did something revolutionary. They started employing sunlight for this purpose in a process called photosynthesis. Thanks to cyanobacteria, life on Earth became visible to the naked eye. As early as 3.5 or even 3.8 billion years ago, these microorganisms started forming microbial mats and building layered dome-like structures known as stromatolites. They looked like piles of stones, but they were alive. The microbes populated the slimy mat layer on the top surface of the stony domes, which were usually scattered in tidal areas. When the tides were out, cyanobacteria were happily photosynthesizing above the water's surface. When the tides were in, fine sediments floating in the water were carried over the stromatolites and were trapped in sticky microbial mats. When the cover of sediment which accumulated on the dome became thick enough to block the sunlight, the microbes moved upwards, producing one fine layer after another. If we slice a stromatolite vertically, we discover fine layers of sediment representing its growth, much like the rings of a tree. This process was repeated again and again, cementing multiple layers on top of each other, forming continuously growing domes or columns. Stromatolites could grow several meters high, forming the first reefs long before the time of corals. They also took part in the continent building process, adding more and more bacteria formed minerals. At about 3.1 billion years ago, the only significant landmass on Earth was the ancient continent Ur, surrounded by a seemingly endless ocean. Although larger than its predecessor, Valbara, Ur was a fairly small continent. It consisted of parts of modern Antarctica, Australia, India, and Madagascar, and its name means original or primitive in German. Cyanobacteria, with their mats and domes, were the only visible life on Earth for billions of years. Stromatolites populated large tidal areas around the continental shores, taking various forms, shapes, and sizes. Cyanobacteria were not only responsible for making stromatolites, these microorganisms played a much larger role in the history of our planet. They dramatically changed Earth's atmosphere by pumping oxygen into it. But there is a little twist to this story. The cyanobacteria were photosynthesizing or utilizing sunlight to obtain energy. And as we know, the byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen that is released into the environment. Theoretically, our atmosphere should have contained oxygen since the appearance of cyanobacteria at least 3.5 billion years ago. But geological evidence indicates that there was no significant, or in fact any, amount of free oxygen in the water or air until around 2.5 billion years ago. But why? One possible explanation is that although cyanobacteria did photosynthesize, instead of releasing oxygen, they were oxidizing iron. Unlike today, Archean oceans were green because of the great amounts of greenish ferrous iron dissolved in them. It's possible that ancient cyanobacteria, or their ancestors, instead of releasing pure oxygen, were binding it with ferrous iron and oxidizing it, or, to put it simply, making it rusty. This oxidized iron was not dissolvable in water as it used to be in its previous ferrous state, and was continuously falling to the ocean floor, accumulating in layers. During the daytime, when cyanobacteria were actively photosynthesizing, Iron particles were falling to the bottom. During the night, no iron was released. Indeed, all over the world, geologists find vast formations where layers of iron oxides alternate with shales and cherts that were accumulated during the Archean times from about 3.5 to 2.5 billion years ago. These layered iron deposits are called banded iron formations, or BIFs. Today, banded iron formations are the major source for mining iron ore, which is used to produce steel. It's incredible to think that everything made of steel, from kitchen appliances to the cars we drive, is a byproduct of photosynthesizing ancient bacteria that lived and produced iron oxide billions of years ago. In the late Archean Eon, 2.5 billion years ago, banded iron formations were deposited less intensively, and free oxygen started to accumulate in the water and the atmosphere. 
2.4 billion years ago, the levels of oxygen on Earth started to rise so fast, in geological terms, that scientists called this process the Great Oxidation or Oxygenation Event. But why did cyanobacteria stop producing iron and start releasing oxygen? The answer is quite simple. All the greenish ferrous iron dissolved in the oceans had been used up. When there was nothing remaining to oxidize, photosynthesizing organisms were left with no other option but to release free oxygen into the environment as the byproduct. As the great oxidation event progressed from 2.4 to 2 billion years ago, the world started to look more like it does today. The planet began forming a protective ozone layer in its atmosphere that blocked the sun's ultraviolet radiation, which was deadly for any form of complex life. The oceans turned from greenish to blue as they lost all of their ferrous iron. For the first time, the sky was deprived of its otherworldly reddish hues and also became blue. Only the moon would have seemed strange because it looked enormous as it was still much closer to Earth than it is today. The geography of our planet also changed by the late Archean Eon. Ancient Ur was replaced by a significantly larger landmass assembly called the Canorland Supercontinent that stretched from north to south and included parts from most modern continents. Canorland existed from 2.7 until 2.4 billion years ago when the continents broke apart and continued their tectonic dance. But what would happen after such a dramatic change in the planet's atmospheric composition and the appearance of a large landmass? It would be the dawning of a new eon.